Uh, all right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's A16Z Crypto Research Seminar. Very pleased to welcome Elaine Shi, uh, professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Elaine has worked on all kinds of different things across computer science. For example, uh, she was visiting us last summer, gave us a talk then about mechanism design. Funnily enough, today she's speaking about the very first thing I ever saw her talk about many years ago, um, Oblivious RAM, and getting us all up to date about uh, sort of the practical impact of it. So Elaine, all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about Oblivious RAM, uh, ORAM for short, and how it evolved from theory to actually large-scale real-world deployment. Uh, so the plan is uh, the following. Uh, I'm going to first tell you a signal story. And, uh, it's also the like, motivating example for the talk. And then I'll tell you how to construct Oblivious RAM. I think some of you may not have heard about Oblivious RAM. Um, it's a simple algorithm, which I teach to my undergrads in my crypto and algorithms class. Uh, so you'll learn about it today. And at the end, I'll talk about the applications and uh, the challenges towards real world deployment. OK, so let me begin with a signal story. Uh, OK, so signal, you know, as you know, it's a private messenger app. It provides end to end encryption for the messages you send. And they also want to support private contact discovery. So in contact discovery, uh, it, it is what you think, right? Uh, Tim sends his address book to Signal, and Signal tells Tim, okay, you know, here are your friends. They're also on Signal. You, you can connect to them. You can send them messages. Uh, okay, so this is a very useful uh, feature, but Tim is worried that, you know, of course his contacts are top secret, <laughs> uh, so he's hesitant to do that. Uh, and so what do you do? Uh, here's a naive solution. So let me first start with the straw man solution, and then I'll tell you what Signal is doing. Uh, so here, uh, imagine Signal has some uh, trusted hardware, a secure CPU uh, in the cloud, uh, you know, Intel SGX, for instance. Um, and you can think of the secure CPU as creating a hardware sandbox. So anything outside is encrypted, like the communication is encrypted, uh, data at uh, rest is encrypted. Uh, and the data is only decrypted inside the enclave where the computation takes place. OK. Uh, so you may think this solves problem um, because you know, all the data contents are encrypted. We must be safe. But actually, if you think about it more carefully, encryption alone doesn't quite solve the problem. And it is well known that access patterns to even encrypted data can leak very sensitive information. Like in this case, um, if Signal observes that the server is accessing let's say, a re record um, corresponding to Itai, then they can know that Itai is Tim's friend. Um, and you, you may be tempted to think that just by permuting all the user records on disk can solve the problem. But actually, this th doesn't really solve this problem. In particular, if you just permute the data, a uh, signal can still learn the social network graph, like even though it's anonymized. Uh, and what's wrong with this? Uh, you know, if you actually have a known social network graph with actual user identities, you can correlate the structures, uh, structure of the two graphs and de-anonymize everyone in this anonymized social network. And this was actually work, um, you know, so I, I had a work along these lines and also uh, uh, Arvind Narayanan and his co-authors also had several papers de-anonymizing social networks. And the moral of the story is like, even though graph isomorphism, we don't know an efficient algorithm for the worst case instance, for these real world instances, it's like very easy. OK. OK, so, so this is like signals problem. But access pattern leakage itself is actually a really more general problem. So let me show you some other examples of access pattern leakage. Uh, so here's a medical example. Let's say you are storing genomic data in the cloud, let's say 23ME. And the doctor is accessing certain snippets in the genomic data. Uh, so for instance, if you see the doctor is accessing snippets related to liver problem, um, you, know, you, you know maybe the patient is being screened for liver problem, and this is sensitive medical information. OK. And this is another example. Uh, everyone's familiar with binary search. Like you know, if you have a database, you want to do binary search on top of it. You would look at the middle element. Depending on the result of the comparison, you either recurse on the left half or the right half. So now, imagine you can see the, the sequence of all the axes. You can e learn exactly what key is being searched. right? So this basically leaks everything about the query. Um, so more generally, from a programming language perspective, if your program has uh, conditionals 
uh, that depend on secret variable. Let's say this if depends on the last bit of the secret key. And then depending on the, uh, which branch is taken, you have different memory traces in each branch. And in these cases, just by observing the memory traces, you can learn the value of the secret variable. OK. So, so finally, here's another example. This is an actual attack that was launched by um, some researchers in UT Austin and Microsoft Research. And they showed, you know, suppose I'm running some off-the-shelf uh, image processing software inside SGX Enclave. And the only thing I can observe is very coarse grain access patterns, namely which pages, memory pages, are being fetched into the enclave. And even with such coarse grain access patterns, they can pretty much recover like, you know, the location and shape of the objects. So this is a, a um, pretty significant problem. And the question we want to ask is, how can we provably defeat access pattern leakage and meanwhile preserve efficiency? So this is what we are going to answer today. Uh, OK, so let's go back to signal story, right? So signal encountered this problem. Back in 2017, they came up with a solution. They say, OK, we are going to linear scan the whole database upon every query. Linear scan is always safe because it doesn't leak which record is being accessed. And they're actually doing something slightly smarter, which is a batch linear scan. So whenever a batch of queries come in, they answer the, this batch in a single linear scan. This is a linear cost scheme, obviously. So n is the total number of memory blocks, a total number of user records. Um, beta is the batch size. Uh, and because they had this linear overhead, they had to have 500 servers um, to basically uh, work with the load they have. OK, so eventually, uh, you know, time moved forward. In 2022, something exciting happened. They got rid of the batch linear scan, and they changed to PathORAM, uh, which is an algorithm that we had published back in 2013. Actually, Hubert is one of the co-authors on this paper, and he is also in the audience. OK, so you know, now we have basically log squared overhead instead of linear. And they were able to cut down the server cost by 100x after deploying PathORAM. Uh, uh, also, yes, Tim. So did, did they just find your paper? Or did, you, did you tell them they should do this instead? Or what's the story? It's, uh, there's actually a story, because back in 2017, they published a blog post. And they, they were claiming that the batch linear scan was outperforming PathORAM. So likely, they didn't have a, the correct, uh, they didn't implement PathORAM in the way that they should have done. Uh -huh. OK, and also, actually, the, uh, I will mention later that this log squared has very small constants. So it is like just really log squared. Actually, in practice, it really just behaves more like log n. And I will explain why later as well. So basically, if you are a Signal user and Signal you know, asks you to send contacts, just feel, free, uh, feel safe to do that. They are running my algorithm. It must be very, very secure. <laughs> OK, all right. Uh, so you know, let, let me actually tell you about how oblivious RAM algorithms work. Um, but I'm also going to tell you a, a little bit story about this whole area, how this area evolved over time. Uh, so what is oblivious RAM? Um, ORAM is an algorithmic technique that can probably obfuscate the memory access patterns. And the security you get is very strong. You can think of it, basically, it gets you the same security as encryption, right? Um, so at first sight, it's counterintuitive because we know we can encrypt data, but access patterns are a side effect of a program's execution. So how can you actually encrypt side effects? Um, and if you look under the hood, I'll tell you how these algorithms work. But just at a very high level, uh, these algorithms are permuting the memory blocks, and they keep shuffling them as you access them. Uh, and in this way, they can obfuscate uh, access patterns. And okay, if you think of ORAM, here's kind of like a diagram that says what it does. Uh, the input is um, a sequence of requests. Every request is either read some address or write to some address. OK, and then um, it will translate each request into a, a multiple physical axes. And the security it promises is that you know, the a distribution of these physical reads and writes should be independent of the input requests, the, the, the secret input data. OK. And um, just, just to distinguish, like sometimes we also call these addresses the logical addresses, and the physical reads and writes are called physical addresses. Uh, and if you ask, OK, what is the security boundary when you actually deploy ORAM on a, a trusted enclave? This is what happens. Like you are actually running ORAM inside the secure enclave, right? This hardware sandbox I talked about earlier. 
And so everything inside is secure, and you know the memory you can think of it as being the adversary, right? The adversary can observe all the memory accesses. Okay. So let me go back to um, ORAM, right? So ORAM was initially proposed by Goldrick Ostrovsky back in the 1980s, uh, and they showed that actually there exists asymptotically efficient ORAMs, right? So remember the naive solution linear scan was linear overhead. Uh, and they, they could construct something with log cubed overhead, which is like very non-trivial in the asymptotical sense. Unfortunately, these algorithms are very complex, and they suffer from astronomical constants. So basically, you really cannot implement these algorithms uh, the way they're, they're described. OK. And on the other hand, they also showed if you want a generic ORAM scheme, you have to suffer from at least log n overhead. So, so the overhead is defined um, by comparing the overhead of the secure algorithm um, versus the overhead of the insecure algorithm. So this is a multiplicative blow up. Question. What does generic mean in this context? Uh, generic mean, if you want to have a um, compiler that compiles any program to a oblivious counterpart. Uh, so if you ask about any specific computation task, it, it may not be subject to this lower bound. But if you want a compiler that works for any program, take an insecure program, give me a counterpart that's secure, that compiler has to in incur log n overhead. I started working on ORAM back in uh, 2011. And back then, uh, there were actually a line of work already that tried to improve Goldrick Ostrovsky, but they were still kind of working with the same framework they had proposed. So it was all these schemes are within the same fr framework, but with some optimizations, you could get rid of one log n, so you get log square n. But nonetheless, all these schemes are very complex. They basically suffer from the same drawback of Goldrick Ostrovsky. They're not practical. OK, so I, you know, I, I looked at the space and I asked, OK, so you know, what are the important questions uh, for ORAM? I mean, obviously, the first question is, can we ever make ORAM practical? Uh, and the second question you know, I was interested in is, like, oh, there's this obvious gap between the upper bound and the lower bound. Can we bridge this theoretical gap? OK, so I uh, started working on ORAM. And I guess in the next, I don't know, maybe more than 10 years, we were able to like, answer both questions. I mean, the, the first question I told you like, about the large-scale deployment of ORAM. I'll tell you actually the algorithm. Um, for the second question, I will not focus on this theoretical question in, the, in today's talk. But we also were able to bridge this gap. And we were able to construct an optimal ORAM with log n overhead. Uh, the, the theoretical construction and the practical one happened not to be the same one. I mean, it would have been nice if there were the same one, but this theoretical one is like, actually not practical. So I'm going to be focusing on the practical side today. OK. Why, why is the theoretical not practical? Um, it, it, the, the space is actually a little bit complicated. There, there's like, um, the, there are simple algorithms that are actually optimal if your block size is large. But if you want to be optimal when the, blocks, the block size is just like log n, um, which is the standard assumption in the word RAM model in all the algorithms literature, then you, the, the scheme we have is complicated. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's not easy to explain why it's complicated. But, <laughs> but anyway, maybe when you see our construction, um, I mean, the, the construction I'm going to tell you today is log squared overhead. In theory, it behaves more like log n overhead in practice. OK, so let's see how to construct an ORAM. So actually, I'm not going to directly tell you path ORAM. I'm going to tell you a scheme that's predecessor to path ORAM. It's called the binary tree ORAM. And basically, this binary tree ORAM itself is a framework for constructing ORAMs. And once you understand the framework, I can tell you what path ORAM is in just one sentence. And also, by the way, this framework basically completely departs from Goldrick and uh, Ostrovsky original algorithm. So let's first think about a straw man. I mean, this is actually the same straw man I mentioned earlier. So what if you, know, you just take all the memory blocks and you randomly permute them? And uh, now, what do you get from this? If you access some block, you don't know which logical address it, it is. So it seems like this gives you some security, but it's actually not too much security. And the issue is because if you go back and access the same block, you are leaking statistical information. You see, OK, this block is accessed more often than others, or maybe these two blocks are often accessed together. Uh, and you can then have statistical inference attack. And this is for the similar reason, like deterministic encryption is not secure, because it leaks statistical information. OK. So permuting things in memory gives only one time security. In other words, if you only access every block only once, then it's secure. But if you, you know, access the same block multiple times, 
it is no longer secure. And, and the moral we should learn from the story is that uh, it seems like every time you access a block, you have to relocate it. Because if you don't relocate it, the next time you access it, you create a linkability, you leak statistical information. So that's why I want you to keep this insight in mind. Uh, it will come up again when I talk about the scheme. So this is the key insight. The blocks have to move around in memory. And in fact, as soon as you access it, it has to move around. OK, so as I mentioned, we have a binary tree-based approach. Uh, and this is like a, in some sense, a simple data structure that I teach to my undergrads. Um, every node in the tree is called a bucket. The bucket has finite capacity. Uh, a bucket can store uh, two types of blocks, real blocks and filler blocks. So the filler blocks, they don't encode any useful data. They're just there for security. OK, so the most important invariant of the scheme is that every block is mapped to some random path. Uh, so here, uh, let me first cheat a little bit and assume the CPU can store an entire position map, which records where every block is. So this position map, as you can see, is very large. It's linear in size. Eventually, we do want to get rid of it, uh, and we will. But for now, let's just uh, live with the idea there's a position map. And let's say the position map, I want to access block X. I can look up the position map starting my CPU's cache. And I find out, OK, X is on the blue path. And now all I have to do is I just have to read this blue path, and I'm guaranteed to find the block X somewhere. Once I find it, I will remove it from the corresponding location, and I'm, now I'm holding it in my hand in the CPU's register. OK. So at this moment, remember what I said the key insight was, right? At this moment, um, it is important to relocate this block I have accessed. Because otherwise, the next time I access it, I will go back to the same path, and that leaks information. Uh, so how do I relocate it? The most natural idea is just to pick a new random path. Let's say I happen to pick the green path. I want to move the block X to this green path. And I mean, of course, I have to re uh, update my position map to reflect that. But I also actually have to write the block somewhere on the green path. And how do I do that? Uh, this is a little bit subtle, because like, you know, uh, the question is, where on this green path can you write the block X? Can you write it to the leaf node? You find a filler bucket? Huh? You find a filler bucket. Um, I mean, filler slot. Yeah, filler slot. But the, the issue is, I guess the question is, is it secure to, like, let's say, just write it into the leaf? Mm. Uh, also, by the way, maybe I didn't make it clear. I'm going to assume everything's encrypted. So the only thing that adversary can see is the access patterns. OK. Uh, so I'm not going to just repeat the encryption again and again. Yes, Jacob. I'm missing something, because if the adversary can see that you read one block, why do mm -hmm. you write, write it? Like the adversary, won't, won't the adversary just be able to see that you just Yeah, wrote? exactly. That's the reason. So it's not secure to write it to the leaf node, mm -hmm. right? Because the leaf node re reveals the whole path. Like You cannot leak what the whole path is, because if you leak it, the next time, let's say, you are accessing the same block, you, you can see, OK, you know, this block from the blue path was relocated to the green path, and now I'm going back to the same path. So that leaks the information. So you cannot write it here. Uh, that's crossed out. And for similar reason, you cannot write it to any of the internal nodes. So even though the internal nodes are like, seemingly more secure, they still leak partial information about the path. OK, so the only thing left is the root. I mean, of course, it's safe to write it to the root because the root is on every path. If I write it to the root, I don't leak information about the new path, right? Uh, so let's do that. And I mean, we are going to encounter a problem if we always write to the root. But for the time being, let's say we are doing that. Uh, and if this is, this, uh, this is actually the scheme, then we can actually think about the security. Uh, the security is actually easy to see, because every time you access something, you are going to visit a random path. And not only so, the path has not been disclosed before. It's a fresh random path. You haven't, you haven't seen the choice of the path before. Yes? But just to clarify, are you reading? Every, are you like taking a read from every bucket along the path? Yeah, you have to read every location because you cannot disclose which uh, location actually contains the block you want. Uh, but when you're doing the new write, you're just writing once to block the... You, you have to do a fake write on all the other positions. Okay. So you also cannot tell which was the location it was written to. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, but that, that's actually a great question. So essentially, the, the implicit assumption is like the, the read and writes, they always go hand in hand. When you read it, you always write it back. You either write the original block back, or you write an updated block back. And you always re-encrypt the new, new thing that you're uh, writing back. 
OK. So um, this is very nice, but there's one remaining problem we have to solve. And the problem is obvious because, OK, there's a problem. And the problem is just like we cannot keep writing to the root because the root will over, overflow very soon. So how do we deal with this question? OK. So basically, uh, what I'm going to do next is first, I'm going to tell you how to resolve this overflow issue. And then, remember, I've been cheating so far. I still have this position map in the CPU cache. I will get rid of that. Uh, and then I'll talk about some improvements to the algorithm, including path ORAM. So let's first think about how to resolve this overflow issue. OK. So to prevent overflow, uh, our idea is also pretty simple. We are going to have some background eviction process. And the eviction process is like some maintenance process that tries to move the blocks up the tree towards the leaves um, in a way such that no bucket will ever uh, overflow with extremely high probability. So the question is, how do you design this eviction process? Uh, there are two seemingly conflicting goals. Like we want to spend um, a reasonable amount of work on the eviction, right? So we, uh, if we spend too little work, then like things can become crowded and overflow. If we spend too much work, then the cost is too high. Like, so eventually, when we count the cost, we are going to amortize this background eviction process to each request. So the cost will be amortized to each request. OK, so how can we kind of balance these two goals? So here's um, a first attempt. And th this is the approach suggested by the original binary tree ORAM. So the idea is also very simple. Every time we make a request, we are going to pick two random buckets at every level for eviction. I mean, of course, I mean, the root level has only one bucket, so we're just going to evict that bucket twice. OK, so what does it mean to pick a bucket for eviction? So here's what it means. Suppose this bucket is chosen for eviction. What I will do is I will scan this bucket, find a real block in the bucket, and I will evict the real block to one of the children. And which child should you write it to? There's only one correct answer, because that block has already been assigned to a random path. And depending on the path you have assigned it to, it should either go left or go right. So in this example, let's imagine the block you have chosen should be going right. So on the right-hand side, you are making a real eviction. On the left-hand side, you have to make a fake eviction. You have to pretend you are evicting to this bucket by reading and writing every position in the bucket. And this is for security. It hides which child you are actually writing it to. OK, so similarly, if you happen to pick this bucket for eviction and the bucket doesn't have any real block in it, you just make fake evictions on both sides to hide the fact that the bucket load is empty. So if you do this, you can see actually the eviction process itself doesn't break security because the access pattern of the eviction process is completely independent of the requests. So because for every request, I'm just picking two random buckets at every level for eviction, and I'm reading and writing that bucket chosen as well as the two, two children, right? OK. So as I said, the eviction process doesn't leak any information, and this is easy to see. Uh, and what remains to, um, um, I, I, I still need to convince you that this actually solves the overflow problem. And in fact, we can prove if you set the bucket size to be roughly log n, then with extremely high probability, none of the buckets will ever overflow. And if you want to prove this, you can either use queuing theory or use like measure concentration bounds. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a very rough intuition of the proof. Uh, so in fact, the intuition is if you look at every single bucket, the dequeue rate is twice as high as the in queue rate. And this is why I'm choosing two buckets rather than one at every level for eviction. So that two matters. Uh, so if the dequeue rate is twice as fast as the in queue rate, you can roughly think of it as an MM1 queue. And the queue length, the probability the number of jobs remaining in the queue exceeds R is exponentially small in R. Um, so th th this proof is cheating a little bit because there's actually dependency on these buckets. But if you just apply like the discrete version of the Berg's theorem, um, you can essentially think of each bucket as being independent. And what do you do with the leaves? What do you do? With the leaves. Oh, leaves is guaranteed. Leaves, we use a uh, just churn, churn up bound. How do you think you them? Leaves is like you are throwing n bots into n beans, and every, every bean, like if the bean size is log n, there's no overflow with extremely high probability. So, because everything is assigned to a random leaf, right? So, you are throwing n bots into n beans. Actually, you only need to have like the, the last level only needs to have like n over log n buckets. 
So if you throw n bus into n over log n buckets, like you're you fine. So like the, do they ever get excused? Sorry, I'm just asking. The, the, the last level, you don't have to evict. You don't need to evict. Yeah, because the bus and beans, uh, that no. already covers it. OK. Um, so this is our um, first algorithm. And the cost so far is like for every access I claim, it incurs log square cost because you are reading a path. And then you pick two random buckets at every level for eviction, right? Bucket size is log n. So log n times log n, you have log, log n squared. Um, OK, so I, I still have to convince you how to remove the position map, because right now I'm assuming the CPU starts this large position map. And this, the answer is one word, uh, recursion. OK, so how, how do you get rid of it? You have this position map. You store it in a smaller ORAM. And then you recurse, recurse until the position map is constant in size. And then you start that in the CPU cache. So as long as your block is large enough to start two um, uh, indices, like two, the, the uh, path information for two blocks, every time you can uh, reduce the size of the ORAM by a half. And after log n stages, you get down to constant. So this recursion does incur an extra log n overhead. So basically log n squared becomes log cubed. But what I want to mention is actually this recursion log n is a different sort of log n. Because in practice, this recursion depth is like usually two or three. And that's because this log has a large base. Like the, your block usually can store many, many indices. Uh, so that's why like for this scheme, it's log cubed in theory. But in practice, it behaves more like log squared. Um, and we can get rid of one of these log n's, which is the bucket size log n. Like so, so like right now, the bucket size is log n. At, you know, the question is, can we make it constant? And indeed, we can. And this is exactly path ORM. Um, but if you make the bucket size constant, you have to make the eviction more aggressive. So what does this mean? Like in the binary tree ORM I talked about, the eviction is kind of silly, right? Because I'm, I chose this bucket for eviction. I'm scanning the whole bucket anyway. But I only ended up evicting a single block. Why not just try to evict as many blocks as possible? Because I've already touched this bucket, right? So, OK, so PathORM says, OK, we are going to try to use the most aggressive eviction algorithm possible. And this allows us to make the bucket size constant. I mean, of course, the proof of this is like uh, pretty non-trivial. Um, so the idea is every time you read, you are going to evict along a path. And you will take the, all the blocks along the path. And you will try to pack them as close to the leaf as possible. So evict as far as possible except that you have to always be subject to the path invariant. So remember, every block is assigned to a random path. And you, you, you can never break that invariant during eviction. So this is the basic idea of the path ORM algorithm. If you do that, log cubed becomes log squared. In theory, in practice, it's more like log n, because one of the log has a large base. OK. Uh, so the advantage of this algorithm is like it's really simple. The pseudocode is like 16 lines of pseudocode. It, we are even counting n diff and n4. Uh, it's so simple, you can print it on a t-shirt. OK. Uh, so let, let me summarize tree-based ORAMs. Right? So these are like simple data structures. Uh, in my opinion, they're actually even easier to um, you know, describe than binary search trees. For me, it's easier to teach this than binary search trees. <laughs> Elaine, I'll bet you mean balanced binary search trees. Yes, but balanced binary search trees. Exactly. OK. Uh, so um, the key insight is like a block is remapped to a new random path every time you access it. Um, and you have to relocate the block in a way that doesn't reveal the new path. And that's the key insight. Um, and for the eviction process, we have to design it in a way such that uh, you know, there's no overflow. And typically, for these constructions, proving no overflow is actually the hard part. Like the security proof is always kind of trivial. <laughs> OK. What do you do if there's overflow? Um, so I mean, you can actually tune the parameter such that the overflow probability is as small as encryption failure. Um, so I mean, in that case, if there is indeed overflow, it depends on whether you want to go for security failure or correctness failure. There are two choices. If it's, you want to go for security failure, you want, want to be perfectly correct, then you just like somehow retry um, a different path. OK, so let me talk about um, the applications. Right? right now, there's like a lot of interest in industry um, about ORAMs. Um, OK, so I saw on Twitter, like, 
Andrew Miller used to have this decision tree about do you need a blockchain? So I tried to do something similar for ORAM. Do you need an ORAM? Okay, so here's a very simple decision tree. Do you need trusted hardware? Pretty much if you do, you need ORAM. Like this is basically goes hand in hand with Intel, SGX, and other trusted hardware. Unless your program is not interesting, unless your program is like a simple straight line program that doesn't you know, have branches or it doesn't like have data structures. I mean, but the set of such programs is very limited. <laughs> and and I, I'm not talking about cryptographic uh, secure multi-party computation at all in this talk, but the answer is the same for secure computation. Like this is actually, it's not often talked about, but if, if uh, secure multi-party computation actually becomes practical, you also don't want to take these programs and convert them to circuits. You, you'll be using ORAM because converting programs to circuits will incur polynomial blow up. So anywhere you need secure multi-party computation and your computation task is interesting, you also need ORAM. Okay, so uh, of course I'm going to talk about blockchain applications, right? Uh, so ORAM is gaining a lot of attention in blockchains. Uh, here are you know, some applications I've heard of. Um, privacy preserving transactions and smart contracts. I'll briefly tell you the flashbot uh, use case and I'll tell you about like privacy preserving lightweight clients. Uh, I'll just go over them pretty uh, quickly. So privacy preserving smart contracts and transactions. So I'm, I'm actually stealing uh, Andrew's slide. Uh, okay, so there's like several um, layer one blockchains that are encrypting transactions on chain. And then uh, the miners are running basically Intel SGX or trusted hardware to uh, run these transactions. Okay. So you, you think like, you know, encrypting the data gives you security, but actually, you know, it, it does not. Um, and the problem is that uh, so these are some of uh, these uh, companies that are doing this. And the problem is like, I think this is Andrew's attack. Like he looked at the, um, th this memory trace for secret network. And from this memory trace, you can actually pretty much learn all the information they claim to hide, like the sender's account, the receiver's account. Uh, so you get like basically no security. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, what's the solution to this problem? I mean, of course, you want to like use ORAM, right? ORAM will hide the access patterns and you can no longer see who's the sender, who's the receiver. Uh, I mean, of, of, there are other like examples, like let's say your smart contract is accessing some NFT and if the miner can see that, okay, you are interested in this NFT, they can front run you uh, and like, you know, basically buy the NFT to jack up the price and so, so like they, they can do this arbitrage. Okay, uh, Flashbots is also interested in ORAM and this is their scenario. Okay, so what is Flashbots? Um, so you may have heard of like DeFi and you know, Uniswap and arbitrage opportunities, opportunities on blockchains, right? So I, I don't have time to go into details, but at a very high level, uh, so there are these um, parties called searchers and they're just watching transactions posted to the public pool and they're looking for arbitrage opportunities. So let's say they find some transaction that they can arbitrage. Uh, and how do they do the arbitrage? They are going to both front run and back run the transaction. This is called a sandwich attack. And they create a, a transaction bundle. And now they are going to work with Flashbots to submit this bundle. So they basically submit this bundle to their private pool. And Flashbots promises, okay, you know, I'm going to uh, create a block that contains your bundle and we are going to split up the profit, for instance. Um, okay. Um, so what Flashbots wants to do is like, they want to run this private pool inside the SGX Enclave because they want to uh, guarantee um, the security for their customers. Like they're also saying, you know, even individual users, not just searches, like even individual users, you are encouraged to submit through our private pool because we can give you the protection against front running and back running. Um, but of course they also have to like convince their customers like they themselves are not front running their transactions, right? Uh, so, I mean, again, whenever you have trusted hardware, you need SGX, uh, you, you need ORAM because otherwise, you know, flashbots can still see, oh, you're looking at this NFT, I can front run you that way. Okay, so this is another potential scenario. And I think Andrew actually mentioned to me they're actually looking into ORAM for this reason because they want to like earn their customers' trust. Um, privacy preserving lightweight uh, clients is another application. Like your phone cannot start the whole blockchain lock but it wants to access some transactions. Uh, so mobile coin is like using ORAM for some, some purpose like this. Uh, but but they, actually, they actually have two different usages, usages for ORAM. This is one of them. Okay, so, so these are the potential applications in 
Blockchains, I, I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, but so if you know other applications, I'm very happy to talk to you about it. Uh, and uh, before I conclude, I want to mention um, our ongoing effort and some of the challenges we face to deploy this technique in practice. Uh, so we are building what's called Oblivious STL. So this is like a standard library for Oblivious algorithms. Uh, uh, more specifically, you can think of it as the Oblivious counterpart of the standard STL library, right? Like you know, C++ has STL, Java also has its own library, like, but we want to pr provide an Oblivious counterpart and we want to offer um, things like data structures, like map, set, priority queue, range query data structures. We want to have common algorithmic building blocks like sorting, shuffling, graph algorithms, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let me explain why I think there is an urgent need for such a library. Um, so even though, you, as you have seen, ORAM is like a very simple binary tree data structure, there's actually still, interesting. there's still like challenges towards deployment. And the first challenge is just lack of awareness. Like for instance, Signal, it took them five years to realize they should be using uh, path ORAM rather than like a naive linear scan. And it's also very interesting to contrast ORAM and ZKP, like zero knowledge proofs. I mean, of course, these are very different Al uh, algorithms that are used for different purposes, but like ZKP has like a lot of awareness in the blockchain community. The algorithms are actually much more complicated than ORAM, I would say. Uh, the, 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 this market is very segmented because there are so many different algorithms and there's no one size fits all algorithm because every algorithm is better at this, but maybe not so great at something else. Um, the, the barrier of entry is higher. Like if you want to find programmers to program ZKP, I think it requires a lot of expertise. Whereas in comparison, uh, ORAM algorithms are actually very simple, but there's like less, just less awareness that you need ORAM. Um, there's actually for almost every task you need, there's a unified solution. Um, the barrier of entry is also lower. Like a lot of these techniques are actually very mature from an academic perspective. Um, uh, Elaine, it's, it's probably worth saying, I mean, go back a slide. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of the current interest in the left column is driven more by scalability concerns than privacy concerns. So, yeah. Whereas there's no kind of scalability story on the ORAM case. That, that's right. I mean, unless you are doing linear scan, then that will be a scalability concern. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so there's another reason why we need to have this oblivious STL. Like, you know, one question is why not just like throw ORAM at everything, right? Just implement path ORAM and call it done. And the uh, problem is that if I know what I need is a map, a priority queue, I need sorting, I need this graph algorithm, like breadth first search, you don't actually have to go through the generic ORAM transformation. There are often a much more efficient oblivious algorithm for your specific task. So if we are going to create a library for these common data structures and algorithms, you can often get like a log and saving on top of just naive uh, ORAM everything. Okay, uh, so there's a line of work on you know, oblivious algorithms. Uh, th there's a mismatch of perf uh, performance metrics. Uh, and let, let me explain what this means. Like when we study algorithms, let's say undergrad algorithms, right? When we teach algorithms, we implicitly use the word RAM model. And this is when your CPU is reading a memory but you can read and write um, data in bytes, in single bytes. And in this simple model, it's very clean. And the nice thing is like the computation overhead is the same as the memory overhead. So that's why when we learn algorithms, we talk about running time. There's only a single overhead metric. There are no two different metrics. Uh, but when it comes to SGX, it's not the case. It's like if your enclave wants to access some data that lives outside the enclave. So your enclave may need to access some encrypted data that lives in insecure memory or disk, you have to do a page swap. You have to talk to the operating system, system. Hey, operating system, get me this page. And the page is at a 4 KB granularity. Uh, if you just want to read one byte, you still have to pay this 4 KB granularity cost. So this, this model actually has a name in the algorithms literature. It's called the external memory model. I mean, external memory model was invented initially not for SGX, it was for something else. But SGX is actually a perfect fit for the external memory model. So what we really need is external memory algorithms. Uh, and uh, 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 why is, are these page swaps so expensive? Because to do a page swap, you have to do a context switch, you have to do a system call. You have to encrypt and decrypt the page, right? Like the, the thing you're fetching, you have to decrypt it, but you also have to cache something out and you have to encrypt that. Uh, sometimes if your data cannot fit in memory, you also may involve a disk swap, which is heavyweight. Okay, 
So, so let me show you why external memory is important for SGX um, type implementation. So this is a work that came out of Berkeley. It's prior work, uh, AbliX. So, uh, so the number shown here is, is not their exact algorithm because we couldn't run their code. We asked them for help and we couldn't compile their code and uh, we didn't get enough help to compile it. So we created a version that's better than their algorithm. Like we did some, some things they didn't do right, we did it correct. Uh, and uh, what happens is like we can see the page swap is more than 90. So I think for their actual work is probably even higher than this because we already did optimizations. Um, so that's the dominant cost. And then we basically redid everything using external memory algorithms. Uh, this paper is appearing in USNIC security and my student Afonso will be giving a talk in August. Um, so we are uh, saving like a 10 to 100x factor than AbliX on real world data sizes. Uh, and with this uh, improvement, the page swap is only like roughly 60% overhead uh, and compute is like 40%. Uh, it, it actually, I mean, initially it should be quite surprising to you like for something as simple as like, uh, so this is Ablivis map, not ORAM, but it uses exactly the same techniques as o ORAM, the, the algorithm I showed you. Um, it's like some, some simple binary search tree, um, so some binary tree data structure. So it should be quite surprising that we can get like so much saving uh, out of like a simple data structure. And, and finally, there's a challenge which is like the security of the implementation itself. And I guess we can also look at AbliX as an example. Like if you look at their code, it doesn't actually achieve the security they claim to achieve. Like because um, the code they are running inside the enclave, like it has these uh, branches that conditions on secret variables, and every branch has a different memory trace. So like if you can do cache timing attack, like you can actually learn the access patterns inside the enclave. So this thing, uh, this kind of problem is like not something we should leave the programmer to figure out because there's actually a very nice uh, formal method technique. It's called um, memory trace oblivious type system. Like um, with my collaborators, like we had several papers that show how to just automate the task of making sure your, pro your program uh, is memory trace oblivious. So you, you said there's a cache timing attack here? Uh, so in the SGX context, um, the, the weakest security you want is like the page swaps are oblivious. But that's usually not enough because if there's a co-resident uh, user application, the user application can do a cache timing attack. Like it can pollute some cache line because the user application and the enclave application, they are sharing cache. So by doing these cache timing tricks, you can learn exactly inside the enclave which memory location is being accessed. And, and there are lots of papers that show how to do these cache timing attacks, so we understand it very well. I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. But then is the example here actually cache timing, or is this just, just uh, you know, like? This one is a cache timing issue because, uh, I mean, like, like, sometimes you can even just attack like by measuring the the runtime of the program, like depending on how bad it is, because like because each each branch has like different memory trace, like even the timing behavior will be different, in, in some sense. Um, so, but anyway, like from an academic perspective, this is again a solved problem. Like these techniques are very very mature. Uh, it's like what what remains is just to like actually get them deployed in the real world. Okay, and um, so this is why like I think. Oblivious STL will overcome a lot of these challenges we face in terms of like deploying ORAM at a large scale. Um, uh, we also want to go for like these features uh, in the medium term. Like we want to have parallel versions of these algorithms. Uh, we, we do have some you know algorithm, algorithmic works on these topics like Oblivious parallel algorithms. Uh, we want to implement some Oblivious programming abstractions. So if the programmer uses these abstractions, we can convert them to an Oblivious counterpart much faster than generic ORAM. Uh, and I mean, we want to use these type system techniques, compiler optimizations to make sure uh, your oblivious uh, implementation is the fastest possible. Okay. Um, we have started working on oblivious STL, but I think we really want to scale up the effort. Uh, so, so far we have released an oblivious map and our next step is to release oblivious sorting algorithms, uh, but we have a lot more things to do. Uh, there, there's some preliminary open source code you can look at. Um, mostly uh, this Oblivious STL is in the first URL, and the second one contains like uh, reference implementations of like ORAM algorithms. Okay, uh, so to conclude, I want to show you another large-scale application of ORAM, 
Uh, apparently, if you go to Pittsburgh, you can buy Oram's donuts at coffee shops. <laughs> so I, I will take you out and buy you an Oram if you come to visit me. Do you need an Oram? Yes. Thank you. Uh, y y yes. Uh, uh, you know. I have a question about ORAMs. Mm -hmm. So I guess in your uh, implementation, whenever you fetch the data from the leaf that will first put it to the root, right? Uh, then I mm -hmm. guess it takes a certain amount of time for it to migrate from the root to the leaf again. Mm -hmm. And I guess you cannot access that piece of data in that time period otherwise. Y you can. Like, because the, the read is accessing the whole path. So as long as you are always moving it along that path, you are reading that path, you can always find it somewhere. Oh, so you pretend I, I read all the way to the leaf level, but I don't actually. Yeah, the read reads the whole path. So it means it reads the root every time. I see, I see. Uh -huh. Makes sense. Thanks. Uh, uh, Yitai. Yeah, I guess there is kind of a gap between the linear scan and the logarithmic ones. So mm -hmm. in, in practice, do you see cases where you know, square root n or, or n to the 1 over k will be better trade off for some, some use cases? I think for only very narrow scenarios, because I, I, I guess, as I said, like this log squared, it's more like a log n, and these constants are very small. So, so if there's an asymptotical difference, like you can probably find some very narrow region or when, where you can argue, or maybe square root n is a little bit better, but it's like, I think, very, very, very narrow region, probably. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think one of the challenges that might remain in maybe all of these applications is about distributed um, trusted hardware clients. Mm, so like yeah. even in mobile coin, I think they have, um, I understand they're one of this, the, the, the best, or they talk about it, but they, they, it's kind of an unsatisfying thing. So if they want to have lots of servers, then each server has to either have like a shard of the data or something, if you want them. That, that's actually a really interesting question. Uh, so if you have a MapReduce or Spark, you can get constant overhead. It's no longer log in. Uh, so I, I think this is one of these citations I, I hit there. Parallel, like I guess one of these papers is about, okay, MapReduce and uh, Spark in, in the algorithms community, it's called the massively parallel computation model. It's another MPC, massively parallel computation. And we show that any massively parallel computation can, algorithm can be made oblivious with constant overhead, and that constant is a small constant. Um, so so th there's a different interpretation of your question. I think I've been talking to some like uh, companies who might be interested, and another kind of parallelization they need is it's like, I think it's what systems people call sharding, but it's essentially oblivious parallel RAM. Uh, like, uh, I mean, you don't want to implement oblivious parallel RAM in the way they're described in the theory papers. Like, I think Snoopy is like maybe one practical example of oblivious parallel RAM. Uh, so essentially, these ORAM algorithms are very amenable to sharding. They're just naturally uh, designed like, to, to shard. Like, you can cut off the, the, the part near the root of the tree, and then it becomes multiple subtrees. And the access pattern is naturally low balance because every request just goes to a random subtree. So that's why they are so amenable to sharding. Oh, actually, also back to your question, you asked about square root n. But the thing is also we don't know any algorithm that's square root n that's like simpler to implement than the log n version, the log squared n version. And I think that's another reason why you don't want to go for square root n. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, yeah, two quick questions, I guess. So, is there kind of interest or something special happening for like MPC friendly ORAM? If you know, going back to Andrew's question, yeah, and the other one is about maybe hardware friendly ORAM. Like, is, would something change or would you do the same? Thing? Yes, it, that's a great question. So, um, I, I assume by MPC you mean well, multi party computation. <laughs> if you want to implement the ORAM not on kind of one, you know, one secure enclave, but basically as a as a multi party computation. Yeah. So I think for most MPC type scenarios, what you need is circuit ORAM. Uh, so what I talked about is path ORAM. And the difference between circuit ORAM and path ORAM is in, in circuit ORAM, you want the ORAM it, algorithm itself to be implementable in a small circuit. Um, and there, you, you need to change the uh, eviction algorithm. You, you can get exactly the same asymptotical bounds as path ORAM, but you are changing the eviction algorithm such that the eviction algorithm itself can be easily implemented in a small circuit because you are going to compute that circuit with MPC. Whereas for hardware, trusted hardware scenario, really you, you can just work with path ORAM, but like for something like Intel SGX, you don't want to just implement path ORAM as is, like uh, as in the original paper. You want to apply these oblivious uh, external memory algorithm techniques on top so you can uh, minimize the number of page swaps. Yeah. And, and also I think there's also some details I omitted. Like basically if you want, um, to, if you want to resist cache timing attacks, like you want even the access patterns inside the enclave to be oblivious, 
then you actually need to implement the ORAM, the eviction algorithm itself in an oblivious manner. And this is like, um, th there's some, some tricks to, to like uh, do it um, obliviously like, efficiently. Like w what you need to do is use oblivious sorting. Um, but I guess like for instance, the oblivious paper, I, I, I guess that, that was, that was, for some strange reason they were using a quadratic, uh, some improved version of a quadratic algorithm. But actually, in, it's actually well known what you should do is like you use like two oblivious sortings to implement the eviction algorithm. Uh -huh. Yes. If you had to run ORAM in a distributed fashion, as you were saying, cut out the top of the tree, and then maybe distribute the subtrees. Yeah. And can you, is there work to making that Byzantine resilient? Like if you want to allow for failed. I, you know, I've actually seen a paper that has the title Byzantine uh, something and uh, ORAM in the title. I haven't looked, I, I confess, I haven't looked at the paper. But I think these are very good questions because from my experience talking to these companies, like a lot of them are interested in some extra property on top of ORAM. Like sometimes it's uh, maybe crash fault tolerance. I mean, yours is a stronger version of crash fault. They want to uh, tolerate crashes. They want to like maybe sometimes have some database type guarantees. Um, so I think these are also you know, some of these um, engineering efforts we have to make to make these schemes like uh, suitable for these, uh, these types of deployments. Yeah. Uh, Tim. So, so obviously you need randomization in a lot of these algorithms. Is that kind of a solved problem? Like getting good randomness kind of within these? Uh, yeah, how, how to get good randomness? I, I mean, I guess there's, this is like a somewhat orthogonal question. Uh, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, there's like some work I, um, by Yevgeny Dodis. I, I've seen some papers. Uh, he has looked at these randomness generator implementations in Linux and proposed like some more secure variants. Um, so, so I think we can just directly rely on that line of work. Uh, you can use, I mean, I think all you need is like generating randomness once, and then, then you can use a PRG to stretch it, to stretch it, right? You can use like AES. To, to stretch some short random C to long randomness, and this would suffice here. Uh, so, so really, you, you don't have to like always sample true randomness for the whole algorithm. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, if you are interested in oblivious STL, talk to me. I, I'm happy, always happy to talk about it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you.